Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Welcome to Coast to Coast AM, the very best in late-night talk radio. I'm Richard Serrett. Augie Nost, welcome back to Coast to Coast. How are you? Well, thank you. Thank you there. I've um, got coffee in hand, and I'm ready to go. <laughs> Great to have you back. So uh, thank you. Back, in the late nine, back in the late 90s, uh, inventor Steve Gibbs appeared on Coast to Coast with Art Bell and talked about his time travel device. I believe uh, Art later received uh, this device, and uh, I'm not sure if he ever tried to use it. I, I seem to recall listening to an episode where Art um, mentioned maybe to a caller, yes, he'd received Gibbs' device, but he hadn't used it, and he was, quite frankly, a little bit nervous, and I would be too, about using it. However. You also have a time device, time travel device, that was given to you by this the same inventor, the late Stephen Gibbs. Um, before we discuss the device itself uh, and what it looks like, um, talk to me about how you met Stephen Gibbs and just give us some insights into who this late inventor was. Well, uh, Stephen Gibbs was kind of, uh, he was almost as weird as <laughs> I am. And he, uh, <laughs> he was an inventor, but uh, this is the only thing that he actually invented. And uh, Art Bell found out about it. Of course, they got together. So he was on the Art Bell show probably three or four or maybe even five times. I was on there with them a couple of times. And we talked about uh, what we have seen and what we have done with it. And what I want to say right off the bat is that uh, Stephen Gibbs is gone right now, which is a shame because he made a device that actually worked. This device is not a toy. Because there are people have any... that have... Yes? So did he have any did he have any actual uh training in physics or engineering? I mean, who was he? Uh Stephen was just a regular guy. He uh, didn't he had some electronic training, but otherwise uh, he he didn't even have a college degree. So he was just one that has studied on his own and he got inspirations. Uh, I had a dinner with him in Omaha, probably around 1992 or something like that. And he explained some of the things that happened to him and also how he got the idea to start with it. He said he had some dreams. These dreams would show him how to put electronics together. And it was explained to him that in this dream, if he did this, he could come and visit with someone on the other side, so to speak, actually in the future. And he started messing with it, and he had put the device together, and some of his friends, they were doing something with it, and evidently they had some really strange experiences. And I got one of the advice from him, and uh, starting out, I used it a lot. I couldn't get anything done. Uh, nothing worked for me until I started to manipulate my brainwave pattern at the same time, lowering the brainwave pattern down to about the bottom of the alpha range, down to around seven cycles per second. That's when things started happening for me. And All right. Before we uh, – just one more question regarding Steve Gibbs. How did you, how did you meet – and hear about Stephen Gibbs. Oh, yes. Um, he was introduced to me through a lady in Omaha that has written something like 105 different books, about 10 of them on time travel. And she, has, uh, she had a long friendship with this guy. And uh, she called me one day and said, 
I'm going to have uh, dinner with Stephen Gibbs. And I asked her, who is that? So <laughs> she explained. And that sounded interesting. So I joined them. And we had, about, I think, a four or five hour meeting at that dinner when we were talking about these kinds of things. And was he reluctant to, to discuss it with you, or was he uh, no, open to no, the idea? Not at all. He uh, he just totally opened up because uh, he had heard me on TV in Omaha, and he knew of me before I knew of him. So uh, it was uh, it was okay, and uh, we discussed things, and he told me some really interesting stories that uh, if you want to hear about them, we can. Oh, for sure, for sure. But just before that, you also were, appeared on a BBC documentary, I believe, uh, with theoretical physicist Michio Kaku on time travel. Had you already known about Gibbs' device by this point when you went on the BBC? When was that? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, that uh, BBC television this documentary was done in 2003. And I probably got the time travel device somewhere around 1995. So uh, I've had it for about 10 years. But when the uh, TV documentary with BBC television was done, uh, Michio Kaku was on there, and a theoretical physicist named Green was on there. And uh, it got very interesting because uh, they had heard, uh, BBC television people had heard about a TV show that I did in Tucson where I interviewed uh, Stephen Gibbs. And also the one that I did on it explained what I did. So they called and I said, we are going to come to the U.S. to do a TV documentary on time travel. Uh, Mitchell Kaku and Green will be there. And there was another theoretical physicist also. And he said, we'd like you to be on it. So uh, I agreed, and I met them uh, in, uh, in New Orleans. And then uh, I demonstrated the time travel device on that TV documentary, which uh, actually was shown to every English-speaking country in the world. So they were shown to over a billion people. But it got very interesting because he, uh, uh, the people from uh, BBC television, they asked some questions about the future. And I told them some of the things that I have seen. But not all of that happened. And I was puzzled about that. But n later, I have learned a lot about timelines. And I realized is that the, the mind of the one that is doing the experiment has great influence on the results and what you can see and what you can experience because that will shift timelines with you. And uh, this is what happened. Back then, when I did this, I was all about government cover-up, government corruption, and I jumped in the middle of it and exposed all of that, and that's where my mind was. And after that, I have changed that. It's become a more of a spiritual nature. So that's why I don't see those things in the future anymore. I, uh, I got to say this. I am not worried about the future at all. It's going to be okay. Oh, that's very encouraging. Well, thank you for that. We could use some good news. <laughs> um, <laughs> just getting back to Stephen Gibbs and your dinner with him in Omaha in the early 90s. Um, did he bring the actual device with him to your meeting? Because, uh, and we'll get into the, we'll get into a description of it. You have one there, um, and it's very portable. This is not like the H.G. Wells, you know, a time machine that we see in the in oh, the no. movie. This is a small portable device. But did he bring it with him? No, he didn't have it there. I didn't even know what it looked like when uh, we had that dinner. But uh, I, um, I got with him, and I got one from him later. But I, um, he explained a little bit about what the device was. And for some reason, I believed him. That's why I got the device. Because also, uh, I read some of Pat Zess's books. That's just a lady in Omaha that introduced me. Uh, you can uh, Google her name and you'll find about 10 different books on time travel for, from her. Sorry, what's uh, her name again? What is her name again? Patricia 
Ress, R-E-S-S. Patricia Ress. Yeah. And uh, that's also the lady that uh, I co-wrote the book with on uh, the one you just mentioned. But uh, for what we, what we did with the device in uh, New Orleans, uh, they had all the cameras there in the hotel room, and I set it up, and I explained how it worked. And it really caught on. Of course, there was too many people in the room, all kinds of distractions, so nothing really happened at that time. And uh, they really loved that. They they really liked it. So uh, okay, Steve Gibbs, okay. but he when he uh, sent it to you or talked about it with you, he issued a, a a warning that this is not a toy, and he gave you, uh, I believe some examples of things that had happened. Well, one story in particular, which involved a, was it a teenager who uh, who had the device? Uh, and yes. Uh, vanished. He was a young man. I don't know about the teenager part, but he was a young man going to college, living at home with his parents. He bought the device from Stephen Gibbs, and they shipped it to him, and uh, he got it. He went up to his bedroom, and he evidently started experimenting with it. And uh, that was in the afternoon. And then uh, in the evening, his mom came up to his room and was going to invite him down for dinner, and he wasn't there. The uh, device, the, uh, <clears throat> the black box was sitting in the middle of the bed. The time coil was there, and everything was sitting right there in the middle of the bed, and it was plugged in the wall. But he was gone. So she uh, thought, well, gee, you know, he went somewhere, so we don't worry about him. And then overnight, he wasn't there in the morning, so she figured, well, she's, he stayed over with some friends. But she also found out he hadn't showed up at school. And that evening, they started to get worried, so they turned in a missing person report. And uh, then the police came out, and they started uh, listening to her story, and they said, okay, yeah, all right, what did you do? Did you kill him? You know how police would think in a case like this? Yes. But, uh, but the thing is that the young man never showed up anywhere afterwards. He was gone. Wow. Wow. So did the police what, what did I the police? Expect? Did the police interview yeah. Stephen Gibbs? Uh, yeah, he, uh, he bought the machine from Stephen Gibbs, yes. But did the police end up, did, did the parents know about this, that the, that uh, their son had bought a, a machine from Gibbs? And did the police end up questioning Stephen Gibbs? Uh, that I don't know if the parents would know about that. He may have told them, but that never came up in a conversation. And uh, Stephen never mentioned that the police contacted him, but his parents did contact him. So he talked with the parents quite a bit. And uh, they were uh, really, you know, just totally out of themselves because of what had happened. And he explained what could have happened. And uh, that didn't make a lot of sense to the parents, he said, but uh, that's really all he could do. So this young man went somewhere, but unable to get back? Or what, what did Gibbs think happened to this young man? Well, uh, he kind of thought that maybe he had put the machine on, or should I say the device, because they thought there's no moving parts in it. And he ended up going somewhere, but he left the device behind, so he may not have had the chance to come back. Let's, let's look at it. If he went to the future, maybe he could reconstruct it, possibly, but if he went to the past where there were no electricity, he would be out of luck. So I know it's possible. A lot, of, a lot of people are interested in the pyramids and Egypt and stuff like that. If they went back to that time, yeah, right. uh, that, that could <laughs> create disaster. So it's possible he went back to the past, yeah. uh, no longer had access to the device. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's possible that he went to the past and lived out his natural life, but in the past. 
That's or absolutely. or he may have or may he may have come to some tragic end in the past. That could very well be also. Because you you never know when you step into that quantum existence, there is things out there that is uh, strange. And maybe if you don't understand it, it can be a little alarming and possibly dangerous. You have the device uh, what, right next to you at this point? Uh, well, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's sitting in a box here. We'll get you to unpack it and, and describe in the best sort of theater of the mind details that you can provide what it looks like and how it works and um, uh, your experiences with it. Augie is in possession of said device and you've got it right next to you sitting in a box. So let's sort of slowly unpack this thing, describe it in as much detail as you can, and then we'll, we'll um, get you to explain how it works exactly. Yes, yes, uh, I have the box right here, and uh, actually it's not in the box anymore. But uh, I can explain what it looks like, and then I will explain a little bit how it would work. First of all, there is a black box that is about six inches by five inches and about uh, three inches deep. It is several switches on it, and there's a few dials that you can tune the frequency of your frequency to the machine. And the way you do that, there is a um, stick plate. And anyone out there familiar with radionic computers, you will know what a stick plate is. That is a plate that is hooked up to the electronics in it. So you rub your finger back and forth until the fingers stick. That's where you want to keep the dial. And then you turn to the next dial and rub the finger back and forth again until the finger sticks, and then you leave the dial alone. And it actually works that way. Your finger will stick when you have got the right frequency and tuned to it. So the right and frequency being what? the, the Like the Schumann resonance? Uh, no, or, uh, the what? frequency of our com should I say, the combined consciousness of the person as well as the body frequency. Because it can also be used as a healing device as a, um, as a uh, you know, radionic computer because there's a well in it. Let's say that you want to heal somebody from at a distance, you can also do that. But for this purpose, there's no need to talk about that. So... You can turn the device on. There's a little red switch for that. And then it is on. And you can plug it in the wall. And the circuit goes from the black box into a very strong electromagnetic um, electromagnet. And you can hold that electromagnet against your solar plexus with the... Uh, I believe it is, I seem to remember, it's a positive end of it goes towards the skin. But you really shouldn't touch the skin. Just hold it in your aura so that the magnetic device will, the, the, the magnetic field will penetrate into the body. And then it goes from the electromagnet to a uh, spiral cord that we put around our head, right at the level of the third eye, right above or between and slightly above the top of the nose between the eyes. And you put that around your head. And now you get the energy that is coming from the black box going through the magnet into the prime coil is what it's called that is around your head. So you make a circuit where you involve the energy of the mind also in coming from what Stephen said, it activates something in the pituitary gland that opens up a channel. And he didn't really explain a lot about that. Because he was very careful about the technology. He really didn't want anybody to know about that. 
Right. Let, let me ask you. Um, so, as I'm trying to understand this, you've you're holding one hand. You've got this electromagnet that you're holding up to your um, your plexus. abdomen, solar plexus. Yeah. yeah. The other hand is holding the uh, is it the stick plate that the box containing the stick plate? Yeah, you can put the, uh, the black box on the table. And then you use uh, what I do. I would use my right hand and my index finger to rub the stick plate. And I hold the magnet with my left hand against my solar plexus. And you have to, to remain in contact with the left hand and the stick plate, the fingers on the stick plate, uh, uh, the entire time? time? Uh, not necessarily. Y yes, you have to hold the magnet there. But when you get the black box tuned to your frequency, then you can let go of the stick plate. You don't need that anymore. It's all set. All right. And when it's determining your frequency, a, co a combination of, <clears throat> excuse me, your, your, um, your body's, <clears throat> the, 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 the frequency generated by your body and your consciousness that yeah. is creating what, a, a unique fingerprint uh, that that frequency belongs to you and you alone. There's no one else that has that, that frequency. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. I think you explained it better than I could. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just trying to understand here as we go along. Yeah, yeah this is okay. good. Uh, you, you did just right. Because uh, let's say that if you are sick, if you have a bad cold and you feel like uh, something that will get stuck to your foot fork into your field, no. Then you will have a different frequency than if you are perfectly healthy and you're in good spirits. So this will tune to the frequency of you at the time you are doing it. Okay. So I've got a good mental picture. I hope listeners do too. Uh, you've got this coil around your head uh, at the level of your uh, third eye or your pine pineal gland. You've got Correct. the right hand on the magnet. You've got the, the black box uh, on the table, but you've got your your fingers on the stick plate. Yeah, um, until, until you get it so that you get it tuned. Right. All right. Then what happens? How do you activate the time travel time travel once device you every, once you have everything set then you should go into deep meditation and that means lowering your brain wave pattern uh i know there are steve said that people have done it without meditation but i tried it and nothing worked for me until i started lowering my brain wave pattern down to around seven and I've been meditating all my life, so that was easy for me. So, uh, what do you mean by down to seven? What do you mean by lowering your brain pattern down to seven? What does that mean? Seven cycles per second. And uh, that's the bottom of the alpha range of brain wave patterns. So that's where I might go. There's something about the number 7.4 cycles per second that has something to do with opening up a channel in the pituitary gland. 7.4. I have read that from uh, sages that uh, in the West here that is talking about 7.4. Uh, so I kind of took their word for it, and I was aiming for that. I'm not so sure I got to 7.4, but I got close, and evidently that's where things started working. Does that take some uh, considerable training? I mean, some people meditate their ent entire lives. Uh, how long did it, I mean, what is involved and how long does it take to be able to meditate, to, to, to train your mind and your brain, rather, your brain to, to lower it its, into the alpha range 7.4 or thereabouts? Sometimes you do it without even knowing it. When you're driving a car, you end up in a semi-hypnotic state. You, oh, I've done that. Yeah. Lower, or you're watching TV. You get totally engrossed in it. And your brain wave patterns come down. There's been experiments proving that they can actually, just by watching TV, the brain wave pattern drops down into the alpha range. And 
that's not necessarily a good thing watching TV because then all the subliminal advertising goes right into the subconscious mind and make a new imprint that you will act on. But when you control uh, yourself, go into meditation and <clears throat> close your mind down. Try to keep all unwanted thoughts out. And uh, this is one of the things that Nori and I teach in the mastermind that we are doing. And it's okay. very effective. You can really get insight. You get thoughts come out of absolutely nowhere with brilliant things in it. And okay, so after you've you've lowered your brain waves into the seven point four uh, range. Yeah. Then what happens? Do you have to set some sort of an intention and decide, do you want to travel to the past, to the future, or does it, wherever it takes you, that's where you go, you follow? No, uh, you kind of, it's kind of like getting in the back of a cab. You got to tell him where to go. So you, you got to set your goal to what you want to do first. And then you have a picture, a mental image of it that is very important. Hmm. I like that imagery, getting into the back of a cab to the Gettysburg Address and step on it. There you go. It could be done. Okay. But uh, what I would say, you asked before also, how long did it take? Well, it took me quite a while. I must have done this for, oh, I don't know, a month or two, quite often. And I got nothing done until I engaged the brainwave pattern like this. But once you start meditating, meditation is usually the gate to higher consciousness. So that made sense to me to start lowering the brainwave pattern into the alpha range, which is the alpha thinking. And that's where you, in, you connect with the universal mind much more than you do otherwise. So how many, you said you tried it for, uh, was it a month or several months before it worked? Did you get discouraged at that point? Did you say this thing doesn't work? Yeah, I did. But I listened to Stephen. He just said, people actually make this work. So I said, okay, I'm not a quitter. So I'm just going to keep doing it. I probably did it at least maybe, oh, I don't know, maybe once a, once a day, once every two days or so for at least a month. But that's so, practice. So let me ask you, is it, it's not, is it physical time travel uh, or is it when we think of HG Wells and the time machine, we think of, you know, if you were observing someone sitting in this time travel device, they would be there and then whoosh, they would be gone. If well, I were to, if I were to watch you wearing this time travel device, you activated it, uh, you're not disappearing, right? You're just, you're traveling, is it? Time travel using consciousness rather than physical time travel. Well, um, let me answer that in two different ways. First of all, I have not been able to get any results when there was somebody else with me in the room. But think of the, the young man that disappeared. That was ah, just yes. by the mind. Right. There you go. Yeah. Exactly. So I would also say that, uh, well, one example actually would probably explain that more than anything. In the, um, I think it was uh, oh, probably around 1999 or so, I just came to Tucson. And I, I did an experiment, where I, a mind experiment using the device, and I found myself walking down the street. And it was clear as a bell around me. I walked down the street, and there were people coming the other way. And it appeared to me as they made eye contact, and they, I was walking straight ahead, and they moved out of my way. So it appeared to me as they saw me. And that's why they, they moved out of my way and moved towards And I walked up to a newspaper stand, and I looked at the, uh, the headlines in it, and uh, I could see read the headlines. And I could read some other things there. You know, you don't you only see the front page in those newspaper stands. And I can see the date on it. That was six months in the future. Six months so, in the future. And what and what year was this? You you were time traveling. What year? That that was it. I would probably the summer of 1999. 
Could have been the okay, fall. Okay, so you're looking at the fall or winter of 1999. Yeah. Do you remember the headline? Uh, there was something about an accident, and that did happen, as far as I know. But the other stuff, I, I don't really remember what it was now. But uh, hmm. some of that, what you see, there are, I have to remember also, there are timelines out there. And uh, what I saw there, that did happen at that time. But what I, other things that I saw around that time did not happen later because uh, evidently I ended up in a different timeline. And boy, am I glad that I ended up in a different timeline because I saw it was not very good at all. Can you tell us what you saw? Well, I saw the, the a total stock market crash and the country turning into total turmoil. The military had to come and take over. And uh, there were military everywhere. They were maintaining the peace because people got so fed up with government, they started uh, doing away with them. And, you know, that doesn't solve problems. So I'm sure I'm glad that that didn't happen. That was the same time travel journey where you were walking down the street in Tucson in 99. That was the headline or was this another trip? Uh, that was a slightly earlier trip. That ah, okay. When the, you know all those calamities happened. Uh, where else have you gone? You mentioned uh, you know walking down the street in Tucson uh, six months into the future and reading the the headline of uh, of a newspaper. Uh, where else have you traveled? Uh, let's say into the past. Well, um, actually. Before I go there, I really need to say something, and that is that uh, when it comes to time travel and you talk to people, usually their eyes roll back in the head and they tell you, yeah, sure you do. Yeah, this is but true. The, the thing is that I have read in about five, six different scientific journals, and it says that, yes, we know how to make a time travel machine. Look at BBC.com. On July 11, 2018, they interview a talk about uh, with scientists that saying that yes, we know how to do it. And then another one is uh, you can go to uh, let's see. Uh, uh, I wrote a note here. I wanted to tell you about there is uh, in uh, there was a time travel a time traveler. He was arrested in New York for insider trading in 2003 because he started out with $800, and in about a couple of three weeks, he had accumulated $350 million. He did 126 high-risk trades and never lost a dime on any one of them. The regulators found out about that, and they said, wait a minute, that can't happen. So they came and arrested him for insider's training. It was hauled into court, and he told the judge, I'm sorry. He said, it got out of hand. I am a time traveler. I read the records, and I found out which companies would, <coughs> would succeed. And he went back and played the game. So he says, I'm sorry, judge, uh, but uh, I'll just leave the money. I'll, I'll just leave. And the judge didn't believe him. They put him in jail. And uh, he was set at a million-dollar uh, bail. One day, I think, no, I said two days later, I think it said uh, in the report, uh, there was a man came in, paid the million dollars in cash, and they both left, and they were never seen again. The trick was this man's name, and you can Google him. Uh, the, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, he had no no fingerprints. He had no record, no driver's license, no nothing. He did not show up in any government records anywhere. And he was in, a, in his 30s at the time. That, uh, Andrew Carlson, right. Andrew Carlson. Yeah. Uh, Andrew actually, Carlson. He, was, he was 44 years old. Yeah. And he turned $800 into $350 million in two weeks, claimed to be from the year 2256. That's correct. 
I did a bunch of research on him, and I found, yes, that is true. Because there is a, there is a, um, a criminal record of the guy. If you check for him, he will show up. So it did happen. And also in the weekly world news and other uh, newspapers, they covered this and they covered other things. Read uh, weekly world news in March 19, 2003. You need a very interesting report. Scientists are saying, yes, we can do this. So what I'm talking about is not so far out there. For those that only watch TV and read the newspaper, they don't know anything. But you need to step out of the box and do a little research, and you're going to find out there's a totally different world out there, literally. And you can participate All right. in it. Um, if, if people want to see you, you know, wearing the, the time travel device, I mean, you've done an excellent job in describing what it looks like and, and so forth. But um, do you ever – do you ever demonstrate it or, or put it on during your broadcast Team Alpha streams? Yes, we have uh, in that, uh, down in the stream a little ways. But I also demonstrated this machine on your show. So uh, On the podcast, yes, Strange Planet, yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm everywhere. So you just go to uh, YouTube and put my name in there, and you probably have an eyeful. But... Uh, and also broadcast team and uh, of course youtube the same uh, we i demonstrate this and i also in the book that you have mentioned a couple of times spiritual science higher conscious thinking and how to access the universal consciousness i uh, in the i think it's the next to the last chapter i talk about and i show people how they can do this without the machine or the device and I also teach people how to use their mind in ways that you normally would think would be impossible. So this is something that uh, people could think about. In fact, I- I'm going to say it now. You can go to Amazon.com and put my name in there, and you read all the things that is in the book, and you'll find out what it's all about. Spiritual science, high co- higher conscious thinking, and how to access universal consciousness. Uh, we've linked up to that as well at coast to coast am.com i i guess just um a, a caveat an important caveat uh, i would assume that if you have some sort of a biomedical device particularly like a heart uh, a pacemaker you don't want to be putting that big magnet up to your solar plexus is that uh, uh, an accurate statement yeah. absolutely if you have anything like that don't even think about it because i don't know what would happen but something could, so you never should even try it. Right. In that case, you just want to you want to use your mind and your mind alone to achieve time travel. So yep. where else have you gone, Augie, into the past? Uh, into the past, I have not done much. I've done most. I, I'm not all that interested in the past. It's gone. I, uh, I, I don't really care. There was a German scientist that did an experiment. And uh, if you want to know more about that, you can uh, find my dissertation on that on broadcastteamalpha.com and time travel uh, shows down there. He did an experiment, uh, Helmut Schmidt. In fact, Google it, Helmut Schmidt time travel experiment. I think it'll show up. He altered the past. It's possible to do that. So the grandfather paradox, that can be dangerous. Yes, it is. In fact, uh, when it comes to the future, uh, my co-host, Nori Love, uh, on the broadcast team, Alpha.com, she does something with hypnosis that I have not heard anybody else do. She takes people in deep hypnosis, take them forward in time to meet themselves and have discussions with themselves to get advice or other things. But that you just mentioned the word paradox. Let's say that you you go and uh, get with Nora Love. She put you under deep hypnosis, take you two years in the future, and you ask yourself, what is the result of what I was doing two years ago? Was it going to be successful or not? And the future self tells you, no, that's going to flop. So you go back and you quit. What if 
that you had not gone forward and then you had not talked to yourself. So you would have continued what you were doing right now and it, because you didn't know that it would flop. You would continue and maybe you would have succeeded. See, that's the danger. We're checking ah, up so on the we, future. But if you go, okay, so here's the difference as I see it, Augie. If you go to the, if you go back into the past and you try to change the past and that could potentially, because you don't know the unintended consequences, it's like the, uh, the butterfly effect. You could, you could cause a, a catastrophe. You could, uh, you could erase yourself in the future. But if, if you attempt to change the past, by going to the past, but if you go, if you go to the future, and and uh, see what lies ahead, you could make changes in the present that, in effect, is changing your past in the future. If that makes any sense, I don't know if if I even understand it. <laughs> well, yes, you got it. You actually got it because the thing about it is going back to change the past. Uh, I could tell you how, I can tell you how to do this, but what you are doing by changing the past, let's say that you did something really stupid and you want to erase that. You go back to some time before that stupid thing and you immerse yourself in a different decision than the one that caused the stupid thing. Now you're not changing the past because uh, the, the future, because the future is energy. It does not go away. It will stay. But you're changing your past into a new timeline where your consciousness will be in that new timeline where the stupid thing didn't happen because you made a different decision. So I don't think you're going to erase the future of the first timeline. It will probably be there, but your consciousness will be in the new timeline you created by altering that decision. Would that that make makes sense? sense. It does. It does. And mm -hmm. I suppose the, the, the idea of uh, different timelines uh, perhaps even negates to some extent the grandfather paradox danger. You got it again. By creating a new timeline, Grandfather's still alive. You didn't have to kill him. All right. So you've been to the future. Um, you say that it's it looks pretty good. We we shouldn't be worried. Uh, well, that's that's one certain timeline, though, right? Yeah. What about there are other timelines potentially that are not so good? Uh, yeah. Uh, one of them started in 2016 when Kennedy uh, won the presidency. And we went through World War Three with nukes and all. And I'm glad Robert I'm not Kennedy, in that one. Robert F. Kennedy won the presidency in one timeline in 2016 and resulted no, no. in World War III. I, I was just kind of in tongue-in-cheek. I said Hillary. I meant Hillary Clinton. Oh, Hillary. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought you said, uh, I said Kennedy. Okay, I hope, Hillary. I, hope Hillary. Somebody I got, got it. a smile out of that one. <laughs> I got it. All right. Uh, how many of these devices are still kicking around? Uh, he made quite a few of them. I, I don't know how many, but uh, there are uh, people that uh, is experimenting with them, and they are seeing things and doing things. So uh, uh, I only know one guy, one other guy that is uh, who's got a device like this, and. Uh, he said he scared him. He was doing, he had some great experiences, he said, but he scared himself, so he's not doing anything more with it. He scared so, himself. Did, did he explain great... how? Did he explain further? How did he scare himself? Well, he uh, ended up doing something that was scary to him. And uh, uh, this is so long ago, I didn't really talk much. He didn't want to talk much about it. He scared himself. I think it had, there was a family situation where something scared him, so he didn't want to deal with it anymore, and he just quit. When you go to the future using either your just your mind 
uh, and meditation or the time travel device. Um, can you describe things in the future that you've seen? Like, I don't know, what, what do, what do cars or trucks look like? Uh, do well, we still have cars and trucks? that's an interesting thing because, um, uh, first of all, uh, I did say before that I'm not worried about the future because it's going to be good in the end, but it will get worse before it gets better, especially now in the Middle East. There is, uh, it's going to look really quite a bit more dangerous than it looks like now. And the fear mongering is phenomenal, but we are watching a movie and it's all planned out. Because, uh, well, we know that the Egyptians, they warned the Israelis about they're getting ready to attack you. And the Israelis did nothing. I hope that can give somebody an idea of that everything is not the way it seems. So uh, there is a plan behind it. But the plan, the, the several plans behind it, one of them will fail miserably but not before it, they're able to scare a lot of people out of their wits. But it's going to be okay. I, at one time, this is really tricky to talk about because when I talk to millions of people, like right now, we give it energy. We give energy to something that is created in all of these people's minds, which also draws that incident it gives it more power to show up in the physical existence with us. All right. Well, we don't want to do that. We don't want to give any more power because, to an already tense yeah, situation. Yeah, it can get really rough over there, but it's going to be good in the end. But another good in the end. Thing, All right. When it comes to the United States, you asked about this, the truck, the pickup trucks. Yes. That is in relation to it. I have talked about it before, and I have looked at it twice. And it still shows up. I've been trying to get rid of this thing in, our, in my timeline, and I haven't been able to. And that is that there's a – what I saw was a couple of big rocks. I'm calling them rocks. It sounds better than asteroids. They came out of the sky and hit the ocean and washed the coast clean because of the tsunami. East coast. But I think we have some time because the, the cars at the time on the road. You uh, traveled to the future. Uh, you saw that the Earth or had a vision, I guess, of the future that uh, at some point in the future, a, uh, a giant asteroid plunges into the ocean, causes a tsunami, um, you know, basically wipes out the – was that the eastern seaboard? Well, there was um... – an understanding. See, when you are experiencing these things, there's no date stamp on it. But I have something that indicates the date stamp, and that uh, there were two big rocks coming out of the sky, and it hit, and the understanding that came with it was that it, it was in the Atlantic, and it okay. would uh, affect the coast all around Europe, Africa, and all of the Americas. So, okay, but what is the timestamp indicator? Uh, okay, based on what? The timestamp indicator is that I saw a lot of traffic on the roads. Cars and pickup trucks looked a little different. Uh, one thing that I was looking at is that pickup trucks, they now you have the hood and then it goes up to the windshield and then over the top of the cabin. But these trucks, a lot of them, they had the top of the cab, and then it was a slant all the way to the beginning, to the very front of the pickup truck. So there were no real uh, angle of the, hood, of the hood towards the windshield. So these pickup trucks don't exist right now. Uh, I saw there is, there is one that... Uh, uh, there are some new uh, long-haul trucks that is coming out this way now, but uh, that was not that was not it. So okay, I, so we're looking at a, a fairly major redesign of these pickup trucks. So, so yeah, that gives us that, that's what I'm looking at. And I think 
It's going to be a few years, possibly, before those. there will be quite a few of those trucks on the road. That's the only right, that buys us some time. of the time step I have. That buys us some time. And, of course, we had um, uh, the, the test, a DART, uh, the double asteroid redirection test. Um, was that earlier this year or last year where the, this NASA mission, they crashed a spacecraft into a nearby asteroid? Um, uh, dimorphos to uh, to test this possible strategy. So it was somewhat successful. They they knocked it off course slightly. Uh, the the other issue though was they also dislodged from the surface like thirty seven or something like that pieces or boulders. Um, so they anyway it, we're in the early stages, but um, we we have some time to I guess per, further per, uh, um, uh, further um, study this um, redirection test. All right, let's go to the phones for Augie Nost, and we begin with uh, Don on the international line in Alberta, Canada. Don, welcome to Coast. Richard, hi, Augie. Hi, Richard, hi, Augie. Um, I feel great, like I'm great to hear from you, Don. Already. I feel like I'm on uh, an old uh, Art Bell show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, welcome. I'm pretty thing this serious. <laughs> so, um, I got a few questions. Uh, okay, so like, if you want to look at your past lives, there's a vibration that you can chant. It's uh, like Hu Acha. Right? It was in a book called Past Lives Dreams or in Soul Travel. There's uh, another one you can use, like if you want to do a soul transfer into the future, you can go Ah Ma Meito. It's a um, Tibetan chant. If anybody was interested, they could look it up online. But uh, I had a friend that was messing around with this, and three times he got into trouble, and three times his guide came and pulled him back. And the third time, he said, um, like when you're using mechanical devices, and he said, this is the last time I'm coming to get you. But he, he told me how frightening it was, like he was lost and he couldn't figure out how to get out and get back on the third time, and it was worse than his other times. But my question is, is isn't it better to like do it naturally or stay behind? Like um, there's a, a Russian scientist who used the... Um, uh, like a Fermanacci, they made a big sheet of alum- had a big sheet of aluminum, basically spiral it up, and it reflects your energy back. Um, it takes a little bit to, uh, to get going on it, but eventually you can actually see the past, the present, the future. And but the one thing that was surprising in some cases, people people can actually see you and ask you who you are when you do that. Um, isn't it like safer to do it that way than? Then good, good question, Don. Uh, Augie, is it safer to do it without the machine and with the machine? I personally think that it's safer without, and uh, you can read about how to do that in the back of my book. But uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the stories that Stephen Gibbs told me about the missing people. There's several people that are missing, not just that one young man that, he, that I mentioned. So uh, I think it's probably safer to do it without, because there you go by mind. Your, your mind is taking you there. And besides that, I think that uh, once you get out there and do these things, you need to understand the environment, because you're stepping into a totally new environment. You're stepping out of the physical and then go back and forth, and you need to understand that environment. Otherwise, it could be really alarming. Let's try uh, Sue, in, west of the Rockies in uh, Chico, California. Sue, Hello. good morning. Welcome. Hi there. Go ahead. Hi, two things. I would like to erase somehow a bad marriage that I had. It was really a nightmare. I had a better husband. I'd like to erase that, and I'd like to go back in the past and marry the man that I'm very much in love with and want to spend eternity with, and I plan to. Oh, I'm well, so glad that that's um, you're probably uh, not in your future, Sue. I'm so glad, Sue, that you've uh, you've you've met someone. Um, I have. Yeah, that's terrific news. So, what can she do about her past, Augie? What do you think? Yeah, I think two things. First of all, the one I would do is forget the past. It's gone. You erase the memory of it. You just nullify it in your mind, and you are good in the new situation. Just continue forward. Simplest way to do it, because if you go back before you met the first husband and start embedding you 
into that situation before knowing that you could make a bad decision but then decide to do a different one and create a new timeline. It could take a little bit to do that, and it, it, it's effort, a lot of effort. It is much easier to erase the memory of it, reprogram the mind. In fact, if you go to Broadcast Team Alpha, I have, uh, vid- I have audios where you, it teaches you how to reprogram the mind for positive thinking and new situations, success, and all these things that we people want. So, Sue, rather than traveling to the past, uh, using a device or using meditation, Augie is suggesting learn how to meditate uh, and to nullify, uh, you know, the, the, the pain uh, from the past. Um, so meditation versus time travel might be the better route. And then focus on the wonderful future that you have in front of you with your, the love of your life. Yeah. Sue, thank you so much for calling. Uh, Michael is in Kentucky. Michael, welcome to Coast. Richard, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can. Um, Do you mind if I make a brief comment uh, pertaining to the crisis in the Middle East before I ask my question? Uh, Yeah, try to keep it brief because I don't want to get sidetracked here. I suppose the audience is in your consideration. Is it possible that perhaps it's not that – The United States and Israel or other parties are complicit in creating these tragedies like 9-11 or the attack, but that perhaps they have the intel and they are forced in the position to ignore it because the criteria uh, that's put upon them to get people to vote to go and carry out their operations, uh, they have to allow an atrocity to happen. If that's the worldview the commanders and the generals take, because otherwise, if they stop the attack, they won't be allowed to go and carry out the operation. So it compounds the problem. That's the only comment I wanted to make for consideration. The question I have is, you were talking about viewing the past, the grandfather paradox, and changing the future and creating a different timeline. Is it possible to, to go and view the past without changing it uh, and answer uh, questions that you may have about past events, such as, Say there was a, something ruled a homicide, uh, but you wonder if it wasn't a suicide or vice versa, and you just want to observe for your own peace of mind, or you had a lost uh, possession or artifact, and you just always wondered what happened to it. Could you go back? Is it possible to, to get the right timeline, or, or is it possible that you would go and, and maybe see events take place that aren't the same events that happened in the timeline we're on now? And thank you. All right. Great, great question, Michael. Thank uh, you. For that. Yes, so, yes, ob- very, uh, observe, observe, learn without changing the past. Absolutely. And uh, the thing about it is that when you go back, don't change anything, but learn from it. Learn what you did that can enhance what you're doing right now. You can learn things that you don't remember. And that that's important. But also, uh, when you... What I talk about in the book, I teach people how to create the timeline into the future with good things in it. And we're doing that on a mastermind uh, uh, project that uh, Nori and I are doing. And what we do, we visualize the future the way we like to have it with good things in it. We place that ball of conceptual visual image into the future at a time-coded event. And then we go back and forth and visit it every day. And now we solidify the line, the timeline to that thing in the future. And when the time catches up, we just walk into it. And I've been able to do that. I haven't had a hardly bad day in my life just about. Uh, everything I do is just seems to work out now. So this works. And... Uh, if you come and join us in the mastermind sessions, I'll tell you, you would really enjoy that because we create the future before we have to live it. And it works. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the call, uh, Michael. I want to. I know time is tight here. I just want to say hello quickly to Acela in West Hills, California, because Acela has a Gibbs uh, device. Acela, welcome. 
Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much for taking my call. I believe in synchronicity. I'm driving a friend home, and I'm listening to the radio, and this comes on. I bought this device from Stephen. Um, God, it, it, it's over 10 years ago, and I tried it, and I tried it. I'll be honest with you. I couldn't get it to work. I was then told that um, maybe I needed to go to Sedona or someplace where there was like a vortex um, and stuff, but I'm, I'm in amazement that there's somebody who – has one and who has actually used it and you're saying that your book can help me <laughs> bust it Absolutely. out and dust, dust it up. Hey, yeah, hey, Asela, um, yeah, the, uh, the, the, the book will help to... you. Go ahead, Augie, quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, get in touch with me. I love to talk to you. I think maybe oh, we can too. help each other. Oh, God bless you. Thank you so much. Can I get, um, I'll get your, um, I looked on Coast to Coast website. I couldn't find your name on there. Maybe I'm looking in the wrong place, but. Um, well, we had a last minute change, but uh, yeah, refresh it. The, the new informa information is there. His website is there. You can contact him okay. through the website I'm and uh, good luck you with that. You will hear from me. Thank you so much for taking the call. So uh, quickly, did you get it to work? You've obviously gotten it to work. Yes, he has. He's, he's gotten it to work. Wow. Well, so I got to run. I got to fly. I'm scared of it too. Oh, I'm scared you. of it too. But I'm scared of the mind. I'll be able to get back or something. So anyway, I will contact you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Augie. Uh, wow, what a ride! Thank you so much for this. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.